Welcome back, every Bendy Body. This is the Bendy Bodies podcast, and I'm your host and founder, Dr. Linda Bluestein, the Hypermobility MD. This is going to be a great episode, so be sure to stick around until the very end so you don't miss any of our special hypermobility hacks. As always, this information is for educational purposes only and is not a substitute for personalized medical advice. I am so excited to have Lisa Ralston with me. Lisa is a physical therapist with over 30 years of experience in orthopedics, bendy bodies, and sports medicine. She graduated from Cal State Long Beach in 1990 and previously owned all sports physical therapy in Parker for 16 years. While Ralston specializes in treating hips, feet, athletes, and complicated connective tissue disorders, she believes in taking care of the whole person. Since 2009, she has traveled internationally treating Team USA Olympians and world-level figure skaters. Lisa was the physical therapist for Team USA figure skating for the 2022 Winter Olympics in Beijing. Lisa is the owner and founder of Ralston Physical Therapy and Wellness in Arvada, Colorado, and she is also licensed in California and offers virtual services. Lisa, hello, and thank you so much for coming on to Bendy Bodies. Hi, Dr. Linda. So excited to be here. Wonderful, wonderful. And I want to acknowledge if anyone's watching this on video, we are sitting in the Colorado sunshine and I have the sun <laughs> shining in my face. So it's good for uh, setting the circadian rhythm, not so good for, for recording video, but we'll get, yeah. we'll get through it. So it's so great to chat with you. I have to, I have to admit that um, I personally have an interest in foot problems and orthotics and am super eager to uh, dig into this topic with you. And so that's what we're going to talk about today. Foot pain, orthotics, and, you know, really just kind of dig into your expertise. So can you start out by telling us why so many people with joint hypermobility have foot pain? Um, yes, absolutely. Um, first, I want to also admit this is my first podcast. So, <laughs> um, and it was actually some of my patients that encouraged me to talk about this um, because mm -hmm. I do want to share. I have so many patients that come who have seen providers and nobody even put their hands on their feet mm -hmm. and just handed orthotics. And there's so much we can do. But basically, because it's so dang hard for bendy bodies to to hold their posture and mm -hmm. it takes so much effort. And so that's one of the reasons that the hypermobile body um, and hypermobile can have stiff areas, which we're going to talk about that affect function. Mm -hmm. But basically, it just takes so much effort to hold the posture. And so that really affects the load on our feet and our function. Mm -hmm. And so we have a lot of compensations and increased load on certain joints and tissues um, because our bodies are working so hard to hold a basic posture and alignment, which is key. That, that makes sense. And I don't know that a lot of us think about posture as it relates to our feet. Right. Yeah. It's our build. It's our foundation. Sure. And I think, I, I think that also our patients and us, you know, there's, we're seeing so many providers and there's so many important things, right. For help for, that we're dealing with GI issues and, you know, POTS and dysautonomia and headaches and cervical instability that the feet are sort of like, oh, we'll get there. <laughs> <You Yeah. know? laughs> and, um, and so I think some of it is, it's just sort of the thing we don't get to because there's so many other important appointments as well. But hopefully after today, we'll talk about some easy things to do that can help us feel better to even help all those other things that we're trying to, to manage that's so overwhelming. Oftentimes, we, uh, the part of our body that hurts the most brings our attention. And we don't right. realize that there are other things like the feet that could affect that. So cervical instability mm -hmm. could actually be improved by yes. working on our feet, right? And we want yes. to catch all the low-hanging fruit. Yes. We definitely don't want to miss... A relatively easy intervention like orthotics yeah. and and addressing yeah. i'm not saying that addressing feet pain is is easy but um we don't want to miss those lower risk type things yeah yeah no there are some very simple things we can do that help right away that help us be able to stand longer walk longer like one of my patients last week who is really 
cervical instability and has already had surgery for Hiari and severe headaches and just extreme fatigue and pain by some other things we did on the with the low hanging fruit pelvis and feet. Mm -hmm. She was able, she's like, I was doing the dishes at eight o'clock last night. I'm so amazed. (laughs) And so we were focused on the pain, but it was really the posture, the fatigue that was helped so much. And she, Mm -hmm. and then her brain was like, oh, I could do that. Right. And so, uh, you know, it's fun for me because a simple little thing we do can sometimes have a big effect um, that we weren't even thinking of. So. Mm -hmm. And and it's all about function at the end of the day, yeah. right? We're yeah. addressing things that we can modify to improve function. So yeah, so that's yeah. great. Fantastic. Can you run us through some common causes of foot pain in people that have joint hypermobility? Um, yes. Yeah. So as we talked about, posture is number one and alignment. So um Alignment of the whole body is really important. And when we have malalignment anywhere up the chain from, we could start with the feet or we could start with pelvis and knee hyperextension, uh, femoral internal rotation, um, um, you know, all, any kind of malalignment will set that posture off and contribute to increased load or um, things that cause pain. Um, So, and of course, we'll talk about excess pronation. Mm -hmm. So our foot, basically our foot has two jobs. So it is a little simple, even though there's multiple joints and tissues. Um, Our foot pronates to adapt to the ground and our foot needs to supinate, come back into supination where the arch comes up to push, to be stable, to push off the ground, to propel forward. And so um, if pro- and pronation is not a bad thing, these are not bad things or things that are wrong with us. It's just how we're made. And so that's one of my approaches is even if we have too much pronation or we're living there or it's too fast, that's what we want to address, that function of pronation. Or if somebody's living in a supinated position where all the weight's on the outside of the foot and the arch is up all the time and there's too much stress and load, then, you know, we can address that. So I'd say those are the two most, the three most common, posture and alignment, excessive pronation, excessive supination. And also what I see uh, probably more so with EDS is a hypermobile first ray. Mm. And I see very tight gastroc and soleus Achilles. And Mm. and I don't know if there's studies on that. Maybe you can tell me I haven't seen them, but... (laughs) Um, even if somebody has a lot of pronation, flat-footed or supinated in EDS, we tend to have tight calves. And I think that's the body's way to stabilize uh, the back of the body um, because so much is unstable other directions. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. so um, uh, I think those can be causes, um, posture and alignment, excessive pronation, excessive supination, a hypermobile first ray meaning big toe where it actually looks like a high arch, but it's not, but that joint's hypermobile. Um, Also, EDS patients tend to have more forefoot rotation. Mm. Um, And so that's something we'll talk about because that usually is not addressed with foot providers, in my experience with patients that come see me. And in the EDS population, and I don't know why this is another research I'd want to see, it tends to be more the right foot. In our dancers and skaters that are more hypermobile in the forefoot, forefoot varus or valgus and first ray. So there's some things that we can do to support that and not correct it, but just support it so that we can function better and be a little more stable. Um, And uh, then, of course, lack of proprioception, right? (laughs) Just because we have that range of motion doesn't mean that's where we should be functioning. So learning where joints are in space so that we can function with better joint alignment. So I think all of those things um, and then fatigue, right? So all the things that go with EDS, um, overall fatigue, pain contributes, even uh, overall body pain contributes Mm -hmm. to foot pain, right? Because... Mm -hmm. We have those days where you're just on the couch, you can't function, or, or you have a big setback because we did too much. And then we're sort of immobile, and then we feel better, so we go do too much, <laughs> right? 
And so that contributes to pain as well. So. Yeah, definitely. I remember the first time that I heard the phrase pain begets pain. And I was dealing with my own EDS and uh, really kind of like at a low point in my life at that point in time. So I've already finished my entire anesthesia residency and was, had been working for quite a while, but I was dealing with my own health issues. And when I heard that, I was like, oh, that's really interesting. But it does seem to really fit, whether it's people that have EDS or not. I've noticed in people that I know, it mm -hmm. seems like if they get one pain problem, then they're more likely to get another pain problem. And we do have lots of data to back this up. Mm -hmm. And so that's where it's, to me, so important to try to do a better job with young people and try mm -hmm. to help their pain as early as possible so that they don't develop other pain problems, you know? And yeah. so we have such a huge responsibility in that. We have a lot of young people yeah. that have pain and yeah. sometimes there's that low hanging fruit there. So yeah, they need to see somebody you know, sooner rather than later that can address yeah. uh, the, the pain that they're having. Two things I thought of with that is one, absolutely, and I think there's research, but um, if somebody's pain is more than a five or six out of 10, we know that neurologically muscles shut down so that we don't load. Mm. And so it's okay if we don't have zero pain, but we need to have pain that's low enough so our nervous system doesn't overreact and shut down muscles. So it's not always that we're weak, it's just things sort of shut down. So if we get the pain down, what could be with support, with manual therapy, um, you know, whatever, lots of different treatment modalities. If we get the pain down, muscle spire, help with support and alignment, that function improves. Um, and that's key, you know, for the nervous system and, um, and all that. The second thing is, you know, after uh, in my clinic, I was seeing a lot more children with um, hypermobility problems um, and um, issues. And so probably from age seven up, I was seeing kids. And um, when I, after working the Winter Olympics and with elite athletes, one of my loves I wanted to get back to was working with kids <laughs> because mm -hmm we can catch things early while they're developing. And it might even be scoliosis, right? Because there's a scoli scoliotic hypermobility and kids are not even checked for scoliosis a lot anymore, right? Mm. And so, but there's also, um, there are biomechanists and doctors who will tell um, parents that we should not put kids in orthotics. <laughs> <laughs> And so there are two opposing philosophies. In fact, I was at a meeting last week and a mother with her 11, 12 year old. And she said, oh, the doctor, I know my son, his feet are so flat like his dad's and he's having a lot of pain and he can't run. And the doctor said, oh, no, no do orthotics, you know. And so it's still out there, that belief. And I'm not saying orthotics are appropriate for every child. However, <laughs> um, it is so cool when you see a child who's so malaligned because of hypermobility or other reasons, it could be an injury or it could be an illness. For mm -hmm. example, my daughter had leukemia when she was four and she's a bendy body. She's now 23, but during treatment and the steroids, she was so floppy. Mm -hmm. um, and I actually, so this was 20 years ago, I made little custom orthotics for her. We put them on and she ran around the kitchen island. And really? so that's so wow. cool when you see a kid because they don't, but it doesn't like the tech, they're usually really good with it. Like their, their bodies will just respond. They don't have mm. 40 years of other stuff. <laughs> 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 so um, I, that's one of the things I've sort of got back to from selling my practices. Um, I do enjoy working with kids and helping them to develop and learn about their bodies and their awareness and, and what the pain means and how to manage it mm -hmm. and nervous systems and all of that stuff, hydration and recovery, you know, all of that stuff to help their bodies feel better so they can go to school and do what activities they want to do. Yeah, absolutely. That's what we want. We want kids to be able to be yeah. as normal, you know, ac active and enjoying yeah. life and going to school and everything. So, so that's really yeah. great. Um, and thank you for sharing that story about your daughter because yeah that is a great great example and in terms of how you approach hypermobile patients how do you approach them differently than non-hypermobile ones 
Well, I, um, I love it when my hypermobile patients provide a thorough history for me. So even if they're coming to me with hip pain, knee pain, or foot pain, like a lot of times are referred from another therapist or doctor or other patients, and it's for foot pain. However, I'm still thinking of the entire person and systems, all systems. And so like Dr. Lindy, you have a page um, available, I think, for people to help fill out a history. So I love it when patients send me a um, page ahead of time. I also have an EDS form where they can sort of check off, you know, are they having um, headaches? Are they having um, dysautonomia, POTS, GI issues, skin issues, um, their other uh, injury um, history, ankle sprain, surgeries, um, all of that. I want to know all of that. And then what's important is when they come to see me, it's what's important to them at that point in time, because, mm-hmm. as right, you know, last week might be totally different than today. And so mm-hmm. at that visit, we're addressing, OK, where are we now? Because it can be so overwhelming, even though um, I'm just treating the foot. I know if we do a few things, we can feel better all over. Mm-hmm. And so um, I address the hypermobile mobile patient with their entire systems first. Then I start with, um, you know, uh, what's important to them, what activities they want to do, where are they at? One of my patients right now can only walk maybe a quarter mile. Mm-hmm. And our goal is to get her walking a mile. And that, mm-hmm. and I have a couple of patients who have gotten now to two miles with um, some support. And I don't see patients uh, several times a week anymore. I see them maybe once a month. Mm-hmm. Um, and so it's not an involved process. It's just um, so then I really start. I look at um, posture, <clears throat> um, entire body mobility. Um, I might take into account Brighton score, but that's not really my focus because hypermobile bodies get stiff areas. And, you mm-hmm. know, as we age, we have yeah. changes in our joint mobility. Right. Exactly. So. I'm going to look at spine and pelvis is very important. And so I check mobility of spine, especially lumbosacral L5 S1 is really important and pelvis Mm, and hip range of motion. So um, uh, if somebody's not moving in their L5 S1 and their sacrum, their hip range of motion might be limited, which can affect their foot during gait. And so I'm Mm. going to check range of motion and standing. I'm going to look at alignment. And I can get a lot of information. Um, And then we do a squat, single leg squat. I can also see proprioception and alignment when we're on one leg, because when we're walking, we're on one leg, you know, 60% of the time, we need to be able to stabilize on one foot and one leg, which is a problem for most of people that I, most patients I see, they come in, they really can't stand on one leg because of pain, because of malalignment, because of instability. Mm-hmm. for example. So we'll do a single leg squat that gives me information. I'm looking at the entire chain, um, their foot, does the navicular, the mid arch drop? Are they, you know, is the femur rotating in? Is their pelvis dropping? I, that tells me there's some weakness in the hip and core. And so I'm looking at all of that, even if I'm treating their big toe. <laughs> um, and then of course, watching walk, and then taking into account what shoe wears they, they are in and they like to wear. I'm not going to, I don't want to push what I think they should wear, especially kids, right? They're going to, I'm going to, I'm going to try to fit what will help their function with what they like. And mm-hmm. so, um, you know, I'm thinking of that ahead of time. And I don't think everybody needs orthotics. We can talk about like how I decide, but so I'm looking at function, both legs together, single leg. Um, do they have a bend in their ankle, their subtalar joint, full squat with good alignment, or do they have to turn their foot out to do that? Um, uh, and then we go to hip range of motion, hip strength, hip stability. So I'm checking all the hip muscles, rotators, checking. Um, then I go to the foot and ankle. Um, and here's where maybe the difference is from what my patients tell me is, and I'd say just real quickly, I assess heel motion. So the heel needs to move not just one direction, but either three or four degrees. And if somebody's Mm -hmm. had a lot of ankle sprains, often they lose that Mm -hmm. rear foot valgus, even in a, in a flat footed hypermobile foot. So that's probably the first thing I check. Then I come up the lateral side of the foot 
the cuboid should move, and then the fourth and fifth metatarsal should be more mobile than two and three. So when I check mm. each metatarsal, they should move like piano keys. A lot of times two and three are stuck together. So then two gets loaded too much. <laughs> and then I'll check first ray, big toe. Big toe is very important. How is that big toe hypomobile too stiff at the different joints? Or is it hypermobile so, uh, one joint and hypo another joint? So I want to know the function of that big toe because our big toe is big for a reason, right? It's 60% bigger because we need to, we're supposed to push off the big toe, not our little toes. Mm. And so um, that's where the posture and function of the foot and just putting our hands on the foot to feel. And I'm also kind of treating and I'm explaining to the patient what, you know, about their foot, you know, and, and I might find this in a foot that's living in pronation and flat footed, and I might find it in a higher arch foot. I'm checking each joint to see what's going on. Um, and so I would say that's, um, oh, and scoliosis. I'm going to look for scoliosis in kids. Um, and and we're going to look at shoes. What shoes are they wearing, for example? Like a hoka might be good for a stiff high arch foot, but a hoka could actually make a uh, hypermobile, excessively pronated foot worse with knee hyperextension, making knee mm. hyperextension worse because it's too soft and it can also decrease our proprioception if it's too soft mm. for some people. So not everybody I would want to put in a soft cushiony hoka, it actually could make their proprioception worse and their knee hyperextension worse. Interesting. Uh, it's so interesting that you mentioned Hoka specifically because uh, that's yeah. what I, I'm not wearing them right now. Right now I'm wearing my <laughs> Ufos, which, oh, uh -huh. which I that's just have good. to, since we are recording video, I <laughs> love these things. They have yes. awesome arch support. They're nice and cushy. I have my indoor pairs and my outdoor pairs. Um, like a recovery so, sandal? Kind yes. Of? yes. Yeah. Awesome. Love those. Love those. Yes. But, I, but I do also wear Hokas. So I'm curious which what type of foot would benefit from a shoe like a hoka and you know hoka has different ones out now so i can't say all hokas um when right. they first came out they were higher platform cushier um i can't remember which you know which line sure. but um and they've changed now so they have some um that are not as cushy so it really that's where i would assess your foot and and your right and left foot could be different but mm -hmm. i would assess your foot mobility and generally, hokas are better for a stiffer foot, somebody who needs mm. more shock absorption, right? Mm. Um, so maybe a higher arch, um, stiffer foot, um, joints are stiff, uh, ankle stiff, and that gives you that aid in mobility. And so that's when that's the type of person, um, banana foot, as you talk to with the dancers, you know, <laughs> yeah. basically a high arch supinated pe pez cavus foot, I would be more likely to put in a hoka. So... Uh, you just used a lot of fantastic words in that last sentence. <laughs> so, I did. Um, and of course, and of course, uh, ballet dancers that are listening to this, or uh, dance medicine physical therapists, are going to know what you mean by a banana foot. I know what you mean by a banana foot. But can you uh, can you distill that down for uh, for other people just so they know? Because I feel like that was really important what you just said. So, a foot that has the innate structure that is a high arch. Mm -hmm. And the big toe can point down. You can make like a dome with your foot and it points easily. Mm -hmm. And the calf tends to be very tight. Um, mm -hmm. um, would be a, basically a high arch stiff foot okay. versus somebody who's very flat footed. So if you step in the sand or in water, you see a, a flat, um, you know, the banana foot. If you have water and you're by the pool, you're not, you're going to see a huge space between your heel and toes. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, and often the higher arch foot, supinated, will have more motion in forefoot valgus, and the toe extensors work harder. Mm -hmm. So if somebody, and I have, it seems like one out of every 10 patients will actually have a foot that is more pronated and then a foot that is stiff. Mm. And so <laughs> they have one of each. <laughs> right, right. And that's where, as we get into some orthotics, orthotics can fail because a lot of labs will make both mm. kind of similar. 
whereas mm-hmm. some labs could make it very different based on flexibility of the shell, contact with the foot. Um, mm-hmm. But I do have patients, and, uh, and I don't know if, that it would be more with the EDS population, although maybe. Mm-hmm. That would be another study. Yeah, that There's would be somebody. a fascinating study. I I honestly had not heard that before, that the right and left foot, um, you know, can be that different. And uh, for people that are listening to this, um, Lisa's doing a lot of different motions with her hands, which is which is great. And um, I would really encourage people to also watch this on YouTube so that they can see, you know, the different things that you're that you're showing. And I know you're going to show some orthotics later as well. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, oh, and I was going to say was sorry, but the no, scoliosis. No, yeah, with scoliosis, we might tend to see a different right and left foot because oh, mm-hmm. as the pelvis or spine um, side bends and rotates, one foot drops down, one foot lifts up. So I would say scoliosis is the other time I would need to do a very different right and left foot orthotic to mm-hmm. create a better posture. Sure, sure. That makes sense. And one other thing that I know that we had talked about when we're talking about shoes, um, mm-hmm. about high tops, or I think you also call yes. them like three-fourths top. Could you just explain a little bit about that and what you suggest. Mm -hmm. So if somebody has a really hypermobile foot, let's say they've had multiple ankle sprains and there's some Mm -hmm. instability and they're like, well, you know, I don't really want surgery. We know there's ligament damage. We know there's inherent instability in that foot and ankle. We're trying strengthening. Um, A lot of time the, the braces are too thick and cumbersome, right? And so I think with an orthotic, I would do a deeper heel cup and more contact. And then in a high top shoe, it just gives a little more external stability um, and and feedback for that postural alignment um, and support so that you can, it can improve that posture. Um, And, you know, shoes, the other thing with, you know, a lot of newer shoes now, if you squeeze, I should go grab, um, or if you have your shoe. Yes, please. Okay. <clears throat> so a lot of a lot of the teenagers I work with, they like, you know, really cute tennies and Nikes, but a mm-hmm. lot of them do not have a firm heel counter. So if you take mm-hmm. your tennis shoe above the heel and you squeeze the back, it's mm-hmm. nice and firm. And this is mm-hmm. a regular low cut. So if you're wearing a three quarter or high top, usually you don't have to worry about this. But in a tennis shoe or a regular, you know, fun shoe. If there's no, if the heel counter is not firm, you're going to have less control um, with instability side to side. Mm. The other thing is look at the nice kind of wide wedge, which Mm. can give a little more stability. Um, Mm. You know, years ago when Nike came out, some of them were very narrow here. I treated a lot of lateral sprains um, Mm -hmm. because, and so firm heel counter can give some support. That's pretty basic a little bit wider at the bottom. And then, you know, a good test if somebody's hypermobile um, and not all shoes are made um, at the same factory. So if I have my Brooks Mm -hmm. and I go buy it at a discount store, it's made at a different factory for a discount store. The the foam can be different. The footbed's different. So go into, I won't name a name brand discount store, but you can (laughs) think of one (laughs) and take, go find a Saucony or a Brooks and see, it should just bend where my toe breaks easily, right? Mm-hmm. But a lot of those shoes, you can bend in half and like a mm-hmm. pretzel. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, there's two, in the orthopedic and sports medicine world, there's a whole like, you know, oh, our shoe, there's a whole sort of trend now in the opposite direction of we're wearing shoes with too much support. That's why we're weaker. Mm-hmm. So I'd say this is different in the EDS population. I for a patient that has some instability or hypermobility, I do want a midsole that gives support that is mm-hmm. not bending it, the shoe in half and, and flexing. And so um, some orthopedic sports medicine providers have the theory that, well, we just need to strengthen and we need to do all this. Well, <laughs> some populations that's true, but not all our patients. So um, those are things I look for to, and I check my patient's shoes and give them suggestions when they go shopping, because even though it says Saucony or Brooks or whatever, it can be made. And also the right and left foot can be made at a different factory. What? Yes. Really? <laughs> yes. So if you buy your shoes from a regular 
store, like a say you go to a store where there's certain stores, there's one in Green Bay that I can't remember the name of, but it was amazing. I had all these like incredible comfort brand shoes. If you go to a store like that, do you think you're more likely to have the right and shoe, right and left shoe made at the same factory? Well, it's more of the not made for discount. So, you know, okay. companies will have a line, like just like a designer might have a line that's made for a discount store versus mm -hmm. what they sell at Neiman Marcus or whatever, for example, right? right? right. So um, shoes can be the same thing. And so um, I would just check it wherever. Running stores usually buy directly from New right. Balance or Brooks or whatever, right? They're buying direct and selling and they are priced a little higher. Mm -hmm. But even if you find, I still look for them on sale, but I test them with my hands. Does it mm -hmm. have a firm heel counter? Where does it bend at the toe? Does it does it collapse midsole? Um, mm -hmm. And if it's somebody that needs support in hypermobility, I'm going to want that midsole to have some good support with some cushion. Mm -hmm. Sure. And, wow. and how we tie our shoes is important. That's another. <laughs> so treating kids. You're, you're blowing my mind right now. Okay. <laughs> oh my gosh. I'm sorry. All these things I didn't write. No, down, don't. Right? No, this is great. <laughs> um, so, you know, treating kids, actually tying shoes becomes a thing. <laughs> uh -huh, sure. Um, so parents, here you go. I'm your advocate. Um, shoes are tied. You know, we have ties for a reason. Mm -hmm. And we can use this. And this applies to skates. Um, soccer shoes, um, cleats, hiking boots, anything. Um, we can, when we tie, we don't want to just pull to the outside. We want to sort of pull, we want to pull that arch together, right? Mm. So um, when I'm tying my shoe, I want to make sure that I'm, you know, pulling this way and not pulling out to the side. Mm. So I want to, okay. I want to hug my arch. Okay. And there's a lot of kids that don't ever tie their shoes now. Right. They just slide them on and off and ruin the heel part. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So I, in that situation, I'll approach the kiddo with whatever their goals are. Mm -hmm. If they're an athlete and they want to run, I say, okay, fine. Kick around, do that. But when you are doing um, like if off land, you know, conditioning um, and working with a trainer, you need to make sure you've got this appropriate support and tie your shoes. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, treating kids, it's kind of, I mean, just that simple little thing can make a difference for them. <laughs> Interesting. Wow. That's really fascinating. And I'm curious to get your take as we were talking about brands. I have some like a, a, a couple of dressier brands that I, <clears throat> excuse me, that I really love. One of them is Atrex, spelled A-E-T-R-E-X. Yes. I love Atrex. Atrex. Yeah. Yep. Yep. I don't know if I'm pronouncing that right. Yeah. Um, Vionics is also okay, but Atrex is probably my favorite. Do you have any recommended brands for either bendy feet or just people with foot pain? Uh, support. Or, yeah. Um, Obey, uh, there's Obeos, um, Nayot, Mephisto. Oh, yes. Nayot's are great. Yeah. I like Nayot sandal, you know, and so it kind of depends on season because, you know, pre-April, March, we're in sandals more. Um, Bionic, um, I have used and I and the orthotics we'll talk about are actually made by Vasily Bionic, although they have sold. It's a different corporation now. Mm -hmm. um, so um, some of them are not don't have as enough arch support in them. Um but their slippers are good, like, you know, for around the house. But now there's so many more recovery shoes and slip on shoes with arch support. Um, Chaco uh, is a good footbed sandal for high arch. Um, mm. And that's a good one. And, you know, Keens and mm. Merrill's are good. Um, Keens are nice and wide. Yeah, they have I good love forefoot. That. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, yeah, I think air to all of those Obeo, Airtrex. Um, how, do you spell, how do you spell Obeo? I think it's O-B-E-O. I, 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 I just want to make sure because I will have links to all of those in the show notes so people can find them more easily. Okay. Yeah. yeah. And I would, you know, in our area, I refer a lot of our patients to um, a store that, sh that sells um, specialty shoes. Mm. So um, they've, a lot of them have a pet orthotist on site and they carry mm -hmm. good supportive shoes. I'll just try to give recommendations with their foot type mm -hmm. uh, and steer them in a direction to try. 
Sure, sure. 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 Okay, great. And uh, when you are finding and treating bendy feet, I know we t- talked about this briefly earlier, but if you could elaborate a little bit more about, you know, do all bendy feet, are they all over pronated? Because of course, that's something that we see quite often that the pronated, the rolling in, mm-hmm. right? Um, and does everyone have flat feet or, you know, tell us more yeah. about that? <laughs> no, I would say it's probably um, 75, 80% flat feet. And then mm-hmm. I would say 20, 30% um, higher arch stiff foot is what mm-hmm. I see in the EDS population. And then there's a small percentage that have one of each. Mm-hmm. So I'd say that's more common. And I think in the general population, over pronation is probably 95%. You know, it's it tends to be more common anyway. And mm-hmm. oh, I think in regards to that pronated or supinated with EDS, if we're looking at treating kids and trying to catch things earlier, um, one of the things um, I like and I tell parents, if I see them usually by around eight or nine years old, how they are orthopedically, meaning how their legs and their feet are over pronated, like if they're super flat footed, their arches are on the ground. If they're like that at age nine, that's probably how they're going to be. Mm. And so I'm pretty confident that if we start a little bit of support, we're not correcting, but we just want to create good alignment for that child while they're developing and growing. Mm-hmm. I think, you know, it's okay around that age. That's a good time to sort of check that. Mm-hmm. Um, because as an adult, it's going to be more of that. And then some adults with EDS, um, they were more flexible as children, right? More pronated. And then, Either the arch can drop more, right, after having kids or just living, the arch can drop more or injuries. And so then you add on other variables to that foot that already was maybe over pronated um, or a sprained ankle, which can then cause stiffness. And so Mm -hmm. you avoid or plantar fasciitis. So you avoid (laughs) or pain under the big toe. So you avoid and then you're standing and living in supination. So it can change. Uh, Mm -hmm. I don't see it as um like i don't know a a specific like diagnosis sort of Mm -hmm. that makes sense sure sure yeah definitely i think that's one thing that um i was i went to a course that was specifically about uh working with dancers and i don't know if you've heard of the physical therapist lisa howell um, but i took a couple of courses from her and they were really really fantastic Uh, for anyone that does dance medicine i'll also link that in the show notes but But she said something that has really stuck with me. And she said, the body is in a constant state of reformation. Mm -hmm. It's like, yeah. Yeah. And and that that gives us hope because that tells us we can also make choices that will help how our body is um, reformatting itself and realigning itself. Yeah. Yeah, Um, absolutely. I took, um, uh, gosh, 2011-12, I went to the... Harkness Center for Dance Medicine course oh. years ago. And that mm-hmm. was really good. I, I enjoyed that. So, um, but yeah, no, absolutely. We're all changing and evolving. And, you know, even our nervous system can affect some of that or mm-hmm. um, our, vascu- our vascular system, you know? Mm-hmm. And so um, uh, I just see, pe- meet people where they're at and mm-hmm. that's where we're, and that's where we're at that day. And that's what we work on to get them to, a place that's um, better. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Awesome. So uh, I want to talk about people who have quote failed PT. (laughs) Um, I've had a lot of patients say to me, you know, I talked to them about going to physical therapy and I'm a lifer, by the way. Um, I've been in and out of physical therapy since I was a teenager and it's Mm -hmm. like the the best tool for me. Um, But I have a lot of people who say to me, it doesn't work for me. Um, So let's talk about when people say that, like, what are some things that maybe they need to be done differently or might have happened in the past? Of course, none of us, you weren't there. I wasn't there. We don't know for sure, but like thoughts about that. And then, um, and then let's talk about orthotics maybe after that, unless if that kind of rolls into this question. Yeah. Yeah. I think it does. Cause I get a lot of people that come and they've tried different orthotics and they didn't work and, and we'll talk about why. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I really, uh, I mean, my patients tell me because they've been to all the providers. So I think what's different is um, looking at all systems 
and it might be including sleep and anxiety, sleep apnea, GI issues, um, uh, nervous system. So um, making sure vagus nerve is, you know, if our threshold of our nervous system is up here, nothing I'm going to do is going to help. And if I give that patient whose nervous system is up here a bunch of exercises and deadlifts and squats, we're, I'm not going to strengthen. Or if my pain is a 7-8, I'm not going to strengthen. Mm -hmm. So I think that's one mistake we make as providers is – and, and, you know, our health, you've talked about this, our healthcare system makes it difficult um, in a 20 minute visit or 30 minute yeah. to address all this. So part of my job is to sort of take all this overwhelmingness and narrow it down to one or two things that are going to help us function, help my patient function. Mm -hmm. And so um, I think one of the biggest mistakes we do as physical therapists is, and, and because there's also a trend towards higher level strengthening right now. So if you look at physical therapy mm -hmm. clinics, um, they are, they look like a big field and gym and big weights and equipment. Oh, really? Interesting. <laughs> oh yeah. So that's the trend. Um, mm -hmm. And you know, that strengthening is really important. Well, it is, but we have to have our nervous system and our system aligned and, and able to accept that training and firing of muscles. And so low load, it's probably not the first time everybody's heard this, but go <laughs> slow and low load. And yeah. so that's where I might start somebody on the reformer or we literally just line things up and practice standing with correct alignment from our foot our arch. Mm -hmm. We forget about the feet, right? So yeah, <laughs> when we're exactly. working on proprioception and balance in a double legged mini squat, we need to maintain our arch and not grip with our toes mm -hmm. so that we're using our core and our pelvic floor. Um, and so I think, um, and then being able to modify. So my patients tell me, cause I'll ask them, um, I just, I'm just with my patients. I don't really think about what I do. And they tell me that I'm able to help them modify. So let's say, mm -hmm their low back and pelvis are having a lot of pain and I give them maybe a muscle energy technique or their hip is pinching. Um, I do a very gentle technique. And if they're not able to do it the traditional treatment way, then I modify it so that they can do this self-treatment without pain. That's the mm. key. Right. We have to modify. We have to either modify by position, by load, by, um, so maybe, you know, um, and so it's modification so that that patient is in a safe place mm -hmm. with their body and their nervous system, and then they'll respond. Mm -hmm. that, that, that makes that. sense. The, the, the nervous system is so important. Yeah. And I think a lot of people don't realize. And I think part of that too is when your nervous system is really, really jacked up, um, your muscles get really, really tight. And a lot of the pain in our bodies comes from our muscles. We might have arthritis and different things going on, but it's possible that the pain is coming a lot from, from the muscles and not as much from the, from the joints and, mm -hmm. and trigger points in the muscles and things like that. Yeah. So getting yeah, that like, nervous system. Yeah. Yeah. Like one of my patients last week that has a lot of issues, EDS, and just really neck and shoulders and arms flared up. And they have degenerative neck issues, uh, some instability, stenosis, right? All that, all that stuff that you might see on an MRI. But I watched her breathe. And when mm -hmm. she was, and she was trying to breathe to calm her nervous system, like she knew she needed to do that. Mm -hmm. But when I watched her breathe, all these accessory muscles were doing all mm -hmm. the breathing. And so, yeah. and so we just slowed it down and we got into a position where she could relax these muscles and she's like mm -hmm. oh and then the air and her diaphragm could move and mm -hmm. then her arm pain went away so sometimes mm -hmm. it's pretty you know and and that's where um i think therapy might fail because we're so busy and we're trying to do our notes and deal with insurance authorizations and <laughs> we're like oh you know <laughs> Yeah. So sorry, insurance companies, if you're listening. But, um, well, if they're listening, if they're listening, I have a few things to say. <laughs> Me too. Me too. But uh, that's one reason. I mean, I, I got out of my clinic because I just want to take care of patients and not be mm -hmm. not be um, focused on that. So I think when we get in a setting where there's three patients in that hour and you've got a document right. and 
uh, I was able to just slow down and get this patient in a quiet, safe place so that they could actually um, get their body to do it and relax and get the pain to go away. I didn't mm -hmm. even touch them. I did after right. I did a little bit, but right. um, so yeah, the nervous, even if I'm just treating the foot or, or the patient sent to me for orthotics, it's never just about the knee, the foot, right? Mm -hmm. Right. <laughs> um, and I think that's the other way our health system fails because we have to, you know, in a doctor's office, you might see, oh, well, if you bring up another issue or body part, you've got to make another appointment and make another right. copay, right? Right. <laughs> so yep. that's where physical therapists, we tend to get it all. Um, so I think um, physical therapy will fail when we don't meet the patient where they're at mm -hmm. and help them get that pain down, nervous system down, postural alignment, um, and for them to feel safe to move mm -hmm. because we can move no matter what state we're in. And mm -hmm. we start to feel better when we feel okay to move. Yeah. yeah. And um, so I think finding your provider that you feel safe with that, you know, will maybe push you a little bit when you're doing okay. And then knows when to back off and how to modify when you're at a place where it's not a good day. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I've definitely been to physical therapists that are really great at those modifications because I have various different problems yeah. and others that are like, Nope, this is the exercise. And so mm -hmm. I, I totally get what you're saying. Yeah. And, and, uh, same thing I think applies, you know, to my practice is it just takes a much longer period of time with mm -hmm. the type of approach that I take. So mm -hmm. it's uh, probably a similar, you know, corollary. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. And I refer out. So once I kind of see if I think, well, their pain is really due to some other things, I'm going to try mm -hmm. to refer out. Or mm -hmm. if the cardiovascular issue is really the big problem, um, mm -hmm. you know, I'm going to ask you or Patty, you know, I'm going to try to refer out so that that patient can address those needs first, and still mm -hmm. give them a few things to help with, you know, what we're working on. Mm -hmm. um, but acknowledging that, you know, um, um, you know, they're not crazy, right? It's just, it's just one thing we need to work on to get moving better. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And tell us about orthotics and how some people have failed orthotics. You know, yeah. I, I hear that too. I know I tried that. Yes. It didn't work. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I've done or custom orthotics for, let's see, I've been practicing 33 years. I think I've done orthotics for, I don't know, maybe 25, 30 years. And using different labs and different types and different materials in the old days, and a lot of orthotics failed because they're too hard. So there's mm -hmm. different materials. And there's also how um, we assess and decide the orthotic. And then there's also how the lab makes the orthotic, right? Mm -hmm. So when I'm, uh, one, not everybody needs orthotic, <laughs> but it, the one reason they fail is because <laughs> we need to assess and feel is the foot and joints hypermobile or is it stiff or is it a combination and what kind of support does that foot need to facilitate good posture so i think that's the mistake is if we go to a provider that just like looks at a foot cast gives an orthotic and they're not looking at posture or flexibility in the foot they're going to fail mm -hmm. and if we just put like a correction on the bottom or whatever, um, and we don't address um, the body's posture and the forces, they're going to fail. Mm -hmm. um, and it also depends on what activities we're doing. So if I have a runner, um, there's not a lot of heel contact. It's, it's crazy, but this is still done all the time. We don't need corrections on the heel in a runner for most runners. So um, anyway, and athletes like a heel or a skate, um, or a ballerina, they're not on their heel. Um, mm -hmm. So they fail for that reason. They fail with uh, materials that are picked, shock absorption versus um, enough support to create good alignment. The third thing is the way the lab makes the orthotic. And, um, and sometimes we cast, um, like some people get casted in standing right? Mm -hmm. So you stand in a foam. Well, if you're flat footed and that navicular or your arch is on the ground and you're standing, that's probably not the right casting technique for that patient. <laughs> if you have a stable neutral foot and you stand there, it's probably okay, right? It's going to meet your foot. Um, 
but so the, the lab that I've used the last 23 years is a total contact, which is different. And there's no correction. So basically it's a partial weight bearing with the joint in neutral, joints in neutral. Mm-hmm. And when the lab, and then my job is to assess the flexibility in the foot. So this um, podiatrist engineer created, he calls it a gib test. And so I assess the rear foot, the midfoot, and I give it a foot flexibility um, assessment. Mm -hmm. And then the lab calibrates body weight, the flexibility in the foot, and the activity level, the velocity. So Mm. if I have a skater or if I just have somebody walking, I'm going to do something different because the load is different. And so with total contact and calibrating how the foot is, the body weight, um, when it's total contact, I don't know if you can see this, when your Mm -hmm. foot, when your foot comes off the ground, the orthotic stays right with you. Traditional Mm. custom orthotics, you'll see a gap. Mm. And you can test that. So for those of you listening, if you're if you have custom orthotics and you're seated, put your orthotic under your foot and just lift your heel up and keep that orthotic under your foot and see if there's a gap under your arch. Mm. So if there's this big gap here and then you're and then you load in your walking mid stance and then it hits this orthotic. A lot of people it doesn't help because you've still Mm. got these forces sort of going like that. But if it stays with you. It's maintaining that posture throughout the gate, which is our goal. I don't want to correct. I just want to facilitate good alignment and posture. So that's how it's different. That's what I do that's a little bit different. I do have semi-custom as well. We'll talk about Vionic um, or Vasily. These are the same company, but um, out of Australia. This is for a high arch supinated foot. And um, mm-hmm. we can talk about specifics of that. Um, and then, um, so I have so many patients that previous orthotics have failed. And it's because the flexibility, the hypermobility and stiffness of the foot wasn't addressed. <laughs> they just took a mold. Mm-hmm. And, and, and right versus left wasn't addressed. So There is there, you know, depending on the foot flexibility, if the foot is really stiff, it can get be a little bit longer to get used to Mm because you're putting something on a stiff foot. Um, Kids, they just go right away (laughs) (laughs) Um, unless they have some tactile issues and we, you know, we don't want anything bugging them that way, you know. Um, So, um, yeah, that's. That's the difference, I think, is facilitating that good posture and alignment, taking into account the foot's flexibility and posture. And then I want to put them on and look and see how that alignment looks Mm -hmm. when they're on one leg, double leg, how they walk and that kind of thing. Sure. Sure. That that makes sense. And are there situations in which, I mean, obviously cost is probably one situation in which people mm-hmm. would purchase a, you know, something over the counter kind of a thing. Yeah. Um, could you talk a little bit about, a little bit more about that? Um, when you're talking about failed orthotics, um, besides the orthotic and casting, what's really important is that the foot be functioning. <laughs> So with the orthotic, it's important to go to a provider that feels and assesses the function of the foot. For example, if I have a tight Achilles, tight gastroxoleus, it can pull my heel a certain direction, right? So if I just Mm -hmm. stick an orthotic in there and I haven't addressed the bend at the ankle, the tight Achilles, the movement of the metatarsals, that orthotic can fail, right? Because the body is not ready for that support. So I think it's an important point is the assessment and the function and movement of the foot needs and lower leg needs to be addressed so that the orthotic can support them. Mm -hmm. Just like a knee brace, if we're trying to support knee hyperextension, but we don't address tight hip flexors or whatever, or, you know, position of the knee, that brace is not going to help, right? Mm -hmm. And also we want that brace to have good contact if it's a supportive brace. Mm-hmm. And so that's where that contact of the orthotic. So, okay. So I just wanted to add that in that that's why the assessment's so important with the orthotic mm-hmm. and not just getting an orthotic. And I think that's why so many fail. 
So while we're waiting for the orthotic, we're doing some foot mobility exercises with balls. We're getting the metatarsals to move. We're getting the cuboid to move, the heel to rock. We're massaging soft tissues. We're getting all that ready for that orthotic. Um, so, yeah. Okay, so different orthotics, right? Is that your question? <laughs> uh, yes, yes, because I know s some people, they, they either can't come to see you to get yeah. orthotics or yeah. uh, they might not be able to afford getting custom orthotics. Right. So what do you suggest in that situation? So, you know, of course I'd want to assess, uh, you know, if you know your foot is really flat-footed and, and, and flexible, you know, the more support, the better. So if it's an over-the-counter, you're going to want a nice deep heel cup. So a good brand might be S-O-L-E um, or um, Vasily. Uh, you can see the name. This is actually a thin one for like a high shoe heel. Mm -hmm. um, this is for a higher arch supinated foot. It has a deal, deep heel cup and it has mm -hmm. a little more support laterally for the foot that has so much motion this way. Mm -hmm. um, so Vasily um, used to only be um, issued through providers, but now my patients can just go online. Mm -hmm. So the blue Vasily that's just kind of looks like this, and they're about $45, $55. Um, and we do heat mold them a little bit, but you don't really have to. Um, mm -hmm. You can go online and find those um, uh, stores are selling them, Rehab, Amazon. And so it just kind of... Average pronation, I would recommend Vasily, the blue one. If it's a high arch supinated foot, there's it's called the Hokey. It's named after Brian Hokey, he's a physical therapist, H O K E. Um, and it has a deeper heel cup. It's made for a supinated foot. Mm -hmm. If your Achilles is really tight, there's a little heel lift as well. Um, this brand makes something called Easy Fit, and it, it has a little heel cup and it has cutouts. So I use that a lot for kids. It has a really nice arch and they can stick it in little Converse and different shoes. I've used them in cheer shoes, like small. Oh. Um, so Vasily makes one called Easy Fit that you can just order and stick in different shoes. That's super easy and inexpensive. Um, SOL I mentioned has uh, on their website, you can sort of put answer questions if you're more supinator and mm. pronator and they can help you decide which orthotic. Um, and by the way, I don't make money off of any of these products. <laughs> <laughs> Disclaimer. Neither do I. <laughs> I sold a ton of them. Um, yeah. And then um, super feet, like, you know, for kids, for some for something kind of mild, um, they're super feet. Um, they give a little bit of pronation control. They make some for skates, um, that sort of thing. And, um, and then the custom ones, I charge, um, uh, oh, and kids, they have kid sizes, too. And there's some different ones. The custom for what I, I don't know if you want to know what I charge. Sure. It, yeah, it'd be know. great to know. So for evaluation, uh, follow-up visit, um, one pair of orthotics is $425. So mm. you don't pay for an extra visit with follow-up. We issue um, and communicate. So the first visit usually include, you know, it includes evaluating, sort of treating while I'm talking, casting, one pair of orthotics and your follow-up visit. Then I usually give some things to work on at home um, and then just follow up by phone or email um, if we need to. And you can go on um, Soul Support's website and look for providers mm -hmm. in your state or area. I don't know about out of the country. Um, and again, though, I would it could be a provider that doesn't put their hands on you. Right. I don't know. <laughs> Even though the orthotic, I would still recommend finding a provider who's good with treating feet or who, um, and I don't know why there's not more. I get, you know, people are like, oh, you know, I've treated so many stinky hockey feet that <laughs> it doesn't even phase me. <laughs> but, I, you know, just I think of um, either a therapist or um, it could be any kind of, you know, provider that can address the foot and moving the foot and that kind of thing. And there's a lot of videos now with self-treatment of feet. Mm -hmm. Oh, so what if a person comes to see you and they do the one-on-one -on -one, um, evaluation and everything, but they want a second pair of orthotics? How does that work? Mm -hmm. um, I don't, I do not charge any extra for that. If they're doing well and they like it, 
I can make any modifications. Like let's say they want a second pair for a dress shoe that's more narrow or for a skate or something, or, you know, a soccer shoe. Um, a second pair is 195 and they do not have to come in. I can just order it. Um, I trim, so I pick different amounts of top covers or cushion. These are very old, by the way. Um, and so they can just order a second pair. I trim them to fit um, in their shoe. Some people, if they have a lot of extra mobility in their forefoot, I add a balance called a sesamoid balance pad. Um, oh. And that can make a big difference, especially if toes are overworking, trying to balance and with proprioception, it just, it just, just sort of aligns that posture from this rotation the other way. And, um, you know, or I might need to add a metatarsal pad if there's one very painful metatarsal. Or if somebody has a neuroma, Morton's mm -hmm. neuroma, where they have burning and pain in between their toes. Um, um, but you can order these pads online um, to add under your um, shoe insert to unload those metatarsals and that nerve pain. Um, so. So I have a lot of people that have had problems with their sesamoids. So I'm fascinated mm -hmm. about the, uh, how you might adapt the orthotic for that. So there's, a, there's um, sometimes I use a dancer pad. Um, this is mm -hmm. actually a sesamoid balance pad made by um, the, um, I'm just going to click on this and see, it's called human locomotion. Um, is the website and you can check that out um, a dancer pad i put underneath a big toe and across the metatarsals and then it unloads those sesamoids mm. so it gives more support um, so that it sort of catches some of that load and decelerates it before those sesamoids um, hit the ground um, and so i've used that a lot with dancers and skaters the um, Sesamoid balance pad I use if there's just so much hypermobility with um, rotation mm -hmm. this way. Um, that tends to work better. And it goes like, here's your foot. It goes like that. Here's your big toe. Okay. And this is under the fifth metatarsal. Okay. That's so if you go to helpful. human locomotion, you can see that online. Um, okay. Excellent. And, and again, I definitely encourage people to watch the YouTube if they can, because that's a great uh, <laughs> visual there. So, and in terms of the over-the-counter orthotics, um, is it best if people go to a store if they can, and that way they can maybe choose from a few varieties and be able to get their hands on them and that kind of thing? Yeah. You know, running shoe stores carry a lot more now and they're more mm -hmm. knowledgeable. Um, so a lot of them running shoe stores will carry super feet, SOL, um, some Vasily, um, Birkenstock even makes some cork footbeds that are pretty nice. Um, so they could go do that again, you know, the shoe store person doesn't know your foot type. And so mm -hmm. they don't necessarily know what to recommend. Um, and so that's where sort of the specifics come in. Um, but if you know, you have a flat foot, the companies will generally kind of guide you. I would say look for a nice heel cup. Um, that's helpful for control and stability. I'd say that's probably one of the first things I would check for hypermobile um, patients. Okay. And as we're getting uh, close to the end here, can you talk a little bit about, I think one of the things that you had mentioned was self-mobilization of feet? Oh, yeah. So one of the things we do is... Um, we all get so stiff in our metatarsals, right? Just with pain or whatever. And so I'll take like a little kitty ball, like a little foam ball. And if you're sitting, you place that ball under your foot, under those mm -hmm. metatarsals, and you just gently press down to mobilize. You mm -hmm. can move that ball back by the cuboid under the lateral side of the foot in front of the heel and, and use the ball to sort of um, mobilize the joints up and down. And then, of course, you can use it to massage plantar fascia. You can put your heel on a ball and rock the heel to get mobility that way. Um, mm. You can also use the ball to sort of stretch by putting your toes on the ball and spreading your toes to create space around the ball. Mm. And so there's some just really nice foot um, mobility exercises. And, you know, even with EDS, what I find is we work a lot on mobility because there's some mm -hmm. areas that are painful and are stiff. Yeah. And so 
maybe that's kind of one of the big differences is addressing those stiff, painful areas is really helpful. Sure. And what what's that ball called again? Uh, well, it could be a little kitty ball, like <laughs> cats play with like a little firm rubber ball. <laughs> mm, okay. um, kittens, cat, like a, <laughs> um, or gotcha. or yeah, or like um, just a small rubber ball. You don't want to mm. use a marble; that's too painful. But just mm -hmm. like a small bouncy ball, something that okay. has a little bit of give, a little rubber ball. But usually, you know, kind of a quarter size or a little bigger, you can get each joint separately. And mm -hmm. then we do a little bigger ball um, where you spread your toes around it. And you can buy inexpensive balls on Amazon or Target, you know, department stores. And anything that sort of spreads and, and um, moves those bones in your feet um, can be really helpful. And sure. then after you mobilize, then the next step is to work on stability and proprioception. So once our foot can move, then the next important phase is to know your foot's a tripod. So you have your heel, your big toe, your little toe. And I'm, and I'm going to work on proprioception and balance and maintaining my arch with that tripod under my foot. Now that my foot has, I can load it everywhere, right? So after I mobilize, I want to work on some proprioception and balance in mm -hmm. that correct alignment and posture of my foot meaning arch, um, you know, not rocking out to the side, not collapsing in. I want to try to maintain that neutral. That's a great exercise without clenching my toes and using my core, all those things. <laughs> <laughs> all those, all those good things. Yeah. Uh, we know that you work a lot with ice skaters and I just wanted to mention if people are listening and if they would like to hear an episode specifically about hypermobile ice skaters, please, uh, send me an email or a voicemail on my website or make a comment on one of the posts about this episode because um, that's something that we've thought about doing, doing an episode about hypermobility in ice skaters. And that would be great to have Lisa back to talk about that. So you talked a lot about other factors that can influence foot pain, foot stability, that kind of thing, like, like um, stability in the pelvis. Are there other things that you do for that? Yes. Yeah, so during my assessment, um, when I'm having somebody stand and I have them do a single leg squat, I'm looking at the arch. Is it collapsing? The alignment of the leg, the pelvis and how much pain they're having. If they're having a lot of pain and they're really looking unstable, I often will have them try an SI belt. SI lock is one brand or Sorola. And we put on that belt and we retest single leg, just trying to balance or single leg squat. And if they're more stable and that lessens their pain, then that is a tool we use for external support to aid in the nice posture to improve function. And at the same time, I'm looking at what the foot is doing. So maybe I don't need as much foot support if they're able to stabilize with their pelvis. Mm -hmm. And do you use any of the Bauerfine brands for that? Lumbar um, Lady and SI Lock uh, or Sorola. Mm -hmm. Those are the two I tend to use. Um, Sorola is a little smaller, the SI lock helps with a little more stability and it's pretty mm -hmm. amazing. Patients will know, they'll just go, wow, like they can stand on one leg. It's easier to go from sit to stand. They have less hip pain or back pain. And mm -hmm. you know, it's pretty immediate. We know if that's going to help or not. And so I'll take that into account with what we're doing with the feet. Maybe we don't need as much postural support at the feet if we have good postural support at the pelvis, which can also help the neck, right? All right. Right. It's all connected. <laughs> it's all it is connected. all connected. That's the yes. bottom line. <laughs> yeah. Um, okay. So last question besides uh, the wrap up here. Um, do you have any favorite hypermobility hacks? I have quite a few, I think, but uh, <laughs> we'll, we'll go to foot. <laughs> um, okay. One I see, um, especially in a higher arch kind of dome foot People complain of numbness, especially like if they're walking or in certain shoes. Um, and so it's very simple. You can just change the lacing where you crisscross. So if you feel the bump on the top of your foot, um, and if that lace hits right where that nerve, the nerve is close to the skin. And so mm -hmm. what I do is we crisscross below, skip a hole, crisscross above it, mm -hmm. and then you create a space for that nerve and you don't get the numbness on top. Oh, that's brilliant. So I've had a, quite a few patients and I've gone to all these providers and I just change the lacing and they go hiking and they're like, that's good. 
<laughs> or they wow. go walk on the treadmill. So that's incredible. That's an easy I, one. I love little hacks like that. That's amazing. Okay. So just to recap that when you're saying that, that you, that you basically skip, actually, Kay, can you show us with the shoe? Yeah. So like in my foot, if I have, I'm real prominent right here and I'm getting numbness in my toes and foot, I would mm -hmm. um, skip this cross. So you put the shoe on, you feel where that bump on top of your foot is, where it's kind of tender. And, and then you unlace and then skip a hole and cross above and below that bump in your foot. So you're unloading that spot right there. Because a mm -hmm. lot of shoes have this, right, where we have the lace goes in, uh, in that little strap there. Mm -hmm. And it pushes down on the top of the foot. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Sometimes that can make that worse. So mm -hmm. it just depends on where the bump in your foot is. Usually it's kind of right here, right where that lace crosses. Mm -hmm. And so if we just cross below and above, we can unload that strap pushing, or that lace pushing on the nerve where that top of the foot is. Mm -hmm. Okay. Fantastic. I love that one. Okay. Where can people find more about you online? So I no longer have a website because I'm, kind of this working part-time this last year, um, you can find me at lisaralstonpt.janeapp.com. So it's a scheduling platform. Um, mm -hmm. I can be emailed at lisaralstonpt at gmail.com. And um, I'd say that's probably the two ways. Okay, great. And we'll make sure to have that information in the in the show notes. So, well, Lisa, thank you so very much for coming on the Bendy Bodies with the Hypermobility MD podcast today. This has been so incredibly informative. I know so many people are impacted by foot problems, so they're going to really enjoy all of the pearls of wisdom that you shared and find this so helpful. So thank you so much. Well, thank you for asking me. It was fun. I love talking about feet, obviously. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> Uh, I was worried I wasn't going to have enough to say. <laughs> I, I don't think we ran into that problem. So. Okay, good. Well, thank you so very much and again, and I will see you soon. Thank you. And thanks for all you do for all the patients and all the work and time that you put into this. It's just amazing. Oh, you're very welcome. You're very welcome. Have a great day. Thank you for listening to this week's episode of the Bendy Bodies with a Hypermobility MD podcast. Visit our new website at bendybodiespodcast.com where you can now view guest profiles and show notes with links to products and journal articles. Leave me a comment, sign up for updates, leave a review or a voicemail, and access the podcast on your favorite player all directly from our website. You may hear your voicemail in a future episode where we answer your question or dive into your gracious feedback. Follow us on Instagram at bendy underscore bodies. We love seeing your posts and stories. So be a buddy and engage our community by using the hashtag bendy buddy. That's hashtag B-E-N-D-Y-B-U-D-D-Y. You can also find me, Dr. Linda Bluestein, on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, or LinkedIn at HypermobilityMD. Visit HypermobilityMD.com for information about medical services and one-on-one -on -one coaching. This podcast is for general informational purposes only and does not constitute the practice of medicine or other professional healthcare services, including the giving of medical advice. No doctor-patient relationship is formed. Do not disregard or delay obtaining medical advice for any medical condition you have. Opinions shared are that of the guest and do not necessarily represent the views of the host or any particular organization. Sponsorship of the podcast does not necessarily mean an endorsement. Thank you for being a part of our community and we'll catch you next time on the Bendy Bodies podcast. <music>